Okay, hello everyone and welcome back. This is the last of our series of lectures on the Irish Revolution with the People's College. Now, my name is John Dorney and I have been the organiser of the lectures. Just first of all, before we get going, thanks to all of you who have supported our lectures. We really appreciate your support. We hope you've enjoyed the talks. Uh, thanks to Fanula Richardson, the People's College, and also Jim Dorney, the President of the People's College, for putting this on. Um, I'm going to do something slightly cheeky. My talk was last week, but I didn't have any copies of my new book. I have them here tonight, so if anyone does want to pick up a copy, you can. Um, we're the topic for tonight has actually changed from the programme because unfortunately our speaker, Brian Hanley, uh, took very ill during the week, and, we, and Will Murphy very kindly agreed at the last moment to take over. Will's going to be talking about imprisonment um, during the Irish Revolution. Imprisonment is a good way to wrap up in a way because it runs right from the, before the start in a way, before the Easter Rising, right until the end of the Civil War. Um, imprisonment is, I would argue, equally as important as armed struggle in the study of revolutions in general, and the Irish Revolution, Revolution in particular, because it pits the revolutionary against the state in a very confined space. Both sides <coughs> know exactly who the other are in prison. And also, the prison is the place where revolutionaries often either have their will broken or become more radical. Um, without anticipating any more of what we'll, we'll talk about, a few words about Will himself. Will lectures in the Matter Day Institute here in Dublin. He lectures in Irish studies. Uh, he's the author of two books. The first is A History of the Gaelic Athletic Association. And the second one, the one which is more relevant to find, is called Political Imprisonment and the Irish, which has just been published by Oxford University Press. So without further ado, can you welcome please Will Murphy. Thanks very much to John and to the organisers of the People's College for the invitation to talk. And, uh, uh, I'll do my uh, best to be a, uh, no doubt I'll be a pale shadow of Brian, but I, I, I'll do my best. Um, so what I want to talk about today is uh, political imprisonment, obviously, and the Irish experience of political imprisonment during the revolutionary period. Um, as you all know at this stage, I'm sure you've been at many of the lectures, the years 1912 to 23 were years of extreme political foment in Ireland. And in very, the state is challenged in Ireland by a series of groups. Um, obviously, we're all very familiar with the nationalist challenge to the state, but it's not just the, just, not, not just the nationalists who challenge the state in these years. There are suffragists who challenged the state in the years before uh, the First World War, and there are trade unionists who were involved in challenging the state at various points during this period. Uh, and one of the ways in which the state responds to this challenge is to jail people, to, to, to put them in prison. Um, uh, and so, as John says, the, the prison becomes this environment in which uh, the state reacts to uh, political activists and the activists in return get to respond to the state and use that weapon of the state, the prison, against uh, the state uh, even more so. Um, so to give you a rough, maybe I should give some numbers to start with. Uh, on, uh, towards the end of June 1921, just at the end of the Irish War of Independence, there were 6,129 uh, people who were imprisoned directly as a consequence of that phase of the Irish Revolution, essentially the War of Independence. Um, they were held across various uh, types of places of incarceration. They were held, about half of them were held in internment camps, um, about a quarter of them were held in Irish prisons, and about a quarter of them were held in prisons scattered across uh, Britain. Uh, so we're talking pretty substantial numbers. So one of the things that's important about imprisonment is it's one of the typical experiences of an Irish revolutionary activist in this period, or indeed suspected activists. Some of them uh, weren't real life activists at all, but just happened to be suspected. Um, when you look at the Civil War, which I'm not really an expert on, but I'll, I'll t talk a little about, uh, the numbers are, are even higher. So come the end, uh, just after the, the conclusion of the Civil War in June 1923, there were just short of 12,000 people in various camps and prisons across the 26 counties of the new Irish Free State. So uh, this is a very, uh, very common experience, and I suppose one of the ways to illustrate this is the executive council who were jailing those people, the you know, new cabinet of the Irish Free State, who were jailing those people in 1923. Every single one of them had been to prison in the previous years. Uh, several of them several times, okay? So it's an absolutely crucial experience for those revolutionaries. Um, despite this, though, um, there's been surprisingly little concerted study of the topic. There's an awareness of it. I think there's a, there's a pretty, all of you could probably name particular prisoners. 
uh, and name particular sites that we're aware of that were crucial to imprisonment during the revolutionary period. Imprisonment is part of the popular consciousness of uh, the revolutionary period. It's one of the things we remember. So, for instance, Kilmainham Jail is one of the most popular tourist sites in Dublin. And Kilmainham Jail was renovated in the 1960s very specifically as a monument to the political prisoners of that period and as a way of commemorating them. Uh, and have many of you done the tour? Yeah? So, you, you know, you all know the emphasis that's placed. Uh, in more recent years, there's been a slightly greater emphasis placed on the ordinary prisoners as well on that tour. But, uh, as you all know, there's a big emphasis on the experience of political prisoners. Um, and we're all familiar probably with the names of Thomas Ashe and Terence McSweeney, you know, the individuals who, for instance, die on hunger strike during the revolutionary period. But apart from that, there's a lot we, we don't know. Uh, and there hasn't really been systematic uh, study of, of, the, uh, of the experience of political prisoners. Um, and one of the things that's interesting to me about these political prisoners is, uh, for a long time, there's been an emphasis on political prisoners uh, in Ireland as reasons around which people mobilise, as a cause for propaganda. Uh, and also, there's been an emphasis upon the ways in which John mentioned it, people become revolutionaries or more revolutionary through their prison experience. Okay? So, for instance, there's a very well-known book on Frongloff, the famous internment camp in which many prisoners were held in the immediate aftermath of the 1916 rising, and the subtitle of it is University of Revolution. Okay? Right? So, in this sense, this is a place where it's not just a place where one is sent, but it's one, it's, these are places where one learns how to be a revolutionary. One emerges a revolutionary from them. But one of the things I want to emphasise as we go along is, for me, what's very important is these are places where people are revolutionaries. Okay? It's where they actually actively act against the state, even while they're in incarcerated by the state. It's not just that they're sitting there, you know, listening to the propaganda being created about them outside, or it's not just that they're listening to talks on drill or proper military activity or uh, Irish cultural classes, they're actually contesting with the state while they're in the prisons. Okay. Um, so I hope to try and demonstrate this across a series of uh, phases here. Um, and I'm going to go through the sort of period more or less chronologically uh, and I'm going to try and make maybe some general points as I, as I do so. Okay? So for me there are a series of phases and I'm going to try and take you through those, those phases. Um, okay. um, if at any point I'm making no sense, stop me, put your hand up, say I, you know, I'm not following this. When, when you know a subject uh, very well there's a tendency to ramble on assuming that everybody else knows it in the way you do. So if I make that mistake please, please stop me. Okay. Um, when I started out this project to write about uh, the prisoners of the revolution, uh, I made a decision that I was going to start in 1912. And I made the decision I was going to start in 1912, well, it's often, I suppose, a date which is regarded as the beginning of the revolution, it's the beginning of the Home Rule Crisis. But it wasn't the Home Rule Crisis that prom prompted me to choose the years 1912. I chose the year 1912 because that was the year in which suffragette prison protests began in Ireland, okay? Um, and suffragette prison protest was, uh, I suppose, imported from Britain, I suppose is the way to look at it. Uh, radical female suffragists had been organising in a uh, group called the Women's Social and Political Union, which was headed up by the Pankhursts from 1903, roughly, okay? And from 1905, they were starting to act militantly in Britain, and as a consequence of the militant activity, that evolved, throwing stones at the windows of government offices, throwing stones uh, in shop windows. Eventually, it would go to the point where they were uh, planting bombs, uh, uh, they were destroying uh, sports grounds, which they regarded as the havens of uh, small middle-class men who were playing golf or whatever, okay? Uh, and so they started to be sent to prison. Uh, and in response to uh, their imprisonment, they started to demand to be treated separately. They said, and this is very typical of the political prisoner, a consciousness of being different. Okay? And an assertion that we are not in prison for the archetypal reasons when we go to prison for committing a crime. We are in prison because we are here for a cause. There is a moral basis for our protest. 
and therefore we should be treated differently. Okay? And so they start to seek special treatment. And the state dithers around this. Uh, it affords special treatment to some of them under a class within the prison which was called first class misdemeanor. Okay? And essentially, that class allowed the state to give uh, special treatment to certain categories of people, very often middle class journalists, again, who, for instance, hadn't actually committed a crime but had written a seditious article, for instance. It was a typical reason why one would get a first class, a first class misdemeanor status. Okay? So, uh, but the state afforded this to some of the women, but not to the others. And so, when they didn't do so, the women started a hunger strike to demand, uh, first of accidentally really almost, it started with one woman trying the tactic out and then a recognition that it worked and they started to do it more in a more concerted manner from 1909. And the state response to that, uh, what are we going to do? Do we release these women? How do we react? The state responds by forcibly feeding them. Okay? And this is uh, the uh, sort of propaganda here from uh, Women's Social Critical Union described, you know, illustrating what they regarded as the, the, the torture experience which was a uh, forcible fee. Okay. Um, so this is happening in, in Britain. In 1908, there's an organisation established in Ireland called the Irish Women's Franchise League. And it's headed up by uh, Hannah Shea Skeckington and Margaret Cousins and their husbands. And they begin to move towards carrying out militant activity in Ireland. And they begin it in 1912, in the summer of 1912. Uh, and from then, uh, between then and the outbreak of the First World, First World War, 27 suffragettes are imprisoned in Ireland. Um, and some of them are imprisoned a number of times. So there are sort of 35 occasions upon which suffragettes are imprisoned. Uh, so how does the state in Ireland, the Irish, you know, the Dublin Castle, you know, the British government in Ireland, respond to the transfer of this suffrage problem to Ireland? Well, uh, the first thing, the first phase in the early summer of 1912, when it's just Irish Women's Franchise League women in prison in Mountjoy, and the state has to respond to them, they try and accommodate each other. So the women say, look, we won't hunger strike if you afford us certain privileges if we can come to that accommodation. And the state in Dublin Castle is anxious to avoid conflict, and so generally they concede to their demands. Okay. So there's very little co conflict, and there's sort of almost a phase of mutual congratulation, where they say, uh, aren't we great here in Ireland? We know how to do things, these things properly. Okay? Right. But then, later in the summer of 1912, uh, Asquith visits Dublin, uh, the Prime Minister, for a meeting, uh, around the Home Rule uh, debate, and he's followed to Dublin by members of the Women's Social and Political Union from London, and they throw a hatchet at the carriage which is carrying Asquith and John Redmond, and they try to set the Theatre Royal where the, uh, where the meeting is supposed to take place ablaze. They literally try to burn it down. And as a consequence, they are imprisoned. And an altogether different experience ensues. Uh, so these women uh, are not interested in reaching an accommodation with the authorities in Dublin Castle. Okay. Uh, and Dublin Castle regards them as militant and doesn't think it can reach an accommodation with them. And so the first hunger strike begins in Mount Joy in the late summer of 1912. Uh, and the state does respond by using forcible feeding in Mount Joy. Now, it's only doing so, it's only forcibly feeding English suffragettes, okay? It's still avoiding forcibly feeding Irish suffragettes in Ireland. Okay? Um, eventually, those suffragettes are released after several weeks on hunger strike. And that sort of phase of conflict passes. And the next tactic the state tries to use is it tries to isolate the women. And this is a very typical sort of structure through which uh, the relationship between prisoners and the state moves. First of all, there's a sense, can we accommodate each other? Then there's periods of conflict. And then, well, can we isolate the prisoners? Is often the next reaction. And therefore, diminish their capacity of protest by isolating them. And the way they try to isolate suffragette prisoners in Ireland is this, this side, they won't hold them a Mount Joy anymore, they send them to Tullamore. Uh, which is, I suppose, a pretty isolating experience. Okay? So, uh, 
they, they, they send the women to Ptolemy. Okay? But one of the things that happens then, quite interestingly, and this is, again, a rather typical experience, is when the women go to Ptolemy, some of their supporters follow them, and they begin to try and drum up support in Ptolemy for the suffragette cause. And so you find a sort of cell, a little cell of suffragist supporters emerging in Tullamore around the fact that there is this group of prisoners there. And the prisoners are kind of, they're, they're almost kind of exotic celebrities who have uh, overrided in the town. And people are anxious to go in and visit them. And when they're released, they hold a big dinner for them, etc. Okay? So prisoners are very often in this way, uh, uh, a way in which people can be mobilised around or became, become involved in a cause. Um, the last phase of suffragette protest then happens in uh, late 1913 into 1914 when uh, the WSPU become regularly active in Ireland and they do so in Belfast. Okay. And their activities are very extreme in Belfast. They try and blow up a uh, cathedral in Lisbon and they, as I say, they, they're, they're, they, you know, they damage various sports grounds. Um, and the state responds to this um, in a number of ways. And one of the ways it responds in late 1913 is it has introduced an act called the Cat and Mouse Act. Okay. And what the Cat and Mouse Act allows the prison authorities to do is instead of forcibly feeding, it allows the women to get to the point where they are ill, sufficiently ill to be in danger. Okay. And then it says, okay, we are going to release you, but we're only going to release you until you have recovered, and then we're going to re-imprison you again. So literally, they're treating the prison, it's like a cat treating the prisoners like a mouse. Okay, so we let you go, and then we catch you again, we let you go, and we catch you again, is the idea. Okay? All right? Um, and so they begin to, to use that, that act in, our, in Ireland. Um, what, one of the things that's interesting is uh, there's a, a scholar of political prisoners who describes them as methodological kleptomaniacs. Okay? Uh, and what he means by that is basically they steal each other's ideas. Okay? All right? And one of the things that happens straight away is that the suffragettes are still conducting their campaign when the first people in Ireland start to imitate them. And the first group in Ireland who start to imitate them are trade unionists who are imprisoned during the 1913 lockout. Okay? Uh, and a series of those trade unionists go on hunger strike. Uh, James Connolly hunger strikes during his imprisonment and achieves his release. Um, a man called James Byrne uh, hunger strikes. He was a trade union activist, uh, activist from Dunleary, Kingstown. Uh, and he actually dies shortly after his release from prison. He contracts pneumonia either, it's not quite clear whether while still in prison or shortly after his release, and he dies. And uh, he's, he's still remembered by the trade union movement as, uh, I suppose, a, a 1913 marcher in the same way as you might think of Max Sweeney uh, for, for the Nationals. Um, another man who hunger strike was a trade union activist in Swords called Frank Moss, who was very involved in agricultural labourers and organising agricultural labourers in North County Dublin. Okay? Uh, and they go on a series of hunger strikes. Um, one of the things that emerges from that is that you have to be careful how you use hunger strike. So James Connolly is well known, and a big campaign is generated around him, and he lets people know he's on hunger strike, and as a consequence, it's an effective tactic. Frank Moss doesn't tell anybody he's going on hunger strike. Nobody knows he's on hunger strike. There's no campaign around him, and so he sits there in prison on hunger strike for quite a long period, being forcibly fed, etc., and, and to no effect whatsoever. Okay? So this is one of the things that's very important, is the capacity to generate publicity around what you're doing, okay, if it's going to be effective. Okay. The next sort of phase, then, is pre-rising prisoners, okay, nationalist prisoners. Uh, not exclusively, I should say, there are a couple of pacifists who respond to the war by engaging in anti-recruitment activity as well, who are, who are imprisoned, okay? Uh, and they're imprisoned under an act, uh, it's Do generally known as DORA for short, but the long name of the act is the Defence of the Realm Act, okay? and effectively empowers the state. It's a piece of emergency legislation which empowers the state to act to protect itself in this time of emergency as it sees it. Okay? Um, and so the British state in Ireland begins to use that act against Irish nationalists from late 1914. The first thing it starts to do is it shuts down some radical nationalist newspapers. 
in early 1915, it starts to restrict the movement of certain activists. So, for instance, they ban Desmond Fitzgerald out of Kerry because they think he may, that might be a place where he might cooperate with a potential German mandate, for instance. Okay, so it's like they, move, they, they insist he has to live in Bray instead. Okay, all right. um, but then they start to use it to imprison Irish volunteer and IRB activists uh, from the summer of 1915. Uh, most of the time, they're imprisoned because they have spoken against recruitment or because they have interrupted a recruitment meeting. Uh, sometimes they're imprisoned because they have broken uh, an order made against them under the Defence of the Realm Act to restrict their movement to a particular place. Okay. Uh, Desmond Fitzgerald is one of those jailed. Lee Mellows is one of those jailed in these period. Uh, a man called Herbert Moore Pym, who was briefly famous as a... a uh, an Irish volunteer organiser is jailed uh, in this period. And they're jailed largely in Mount Joy and in Belfast. Okay. Um, the pacifists who are jailed are Francis Sheehy Skeffington and a man called George A. Dunlop. Okay? And both Sheehy Skeffington and Dunlop are jailed for a similar reason. They, they put up, Dunlop puts up posters calling on people not to join the British Army and Francis Sheehy Skeffington gives a series of speeches calling people not to join the British Army. Okay. Um, this group don't copy, or at least most of them don't copy the suffragettes. So having said they stole people's ideas, this group don't actually, for, uh, mostly. And they look back to an older model of imprisonment. And the models they look back to are the Fenians of the late 19th century. And when they go to prison, they think their experience is going to be like that of Tom Clark or, or, or John Daly from Limerick. Okay? And they're expecting a really harsh regime, Okay, which they actually don't find when they get there, but they're also satisfied with imprisonment as a sort of imprisonment of propaganda, as joining the march of the elite who have gone to prison. And they like to associate themselves with the Fenian prisoners of the past, but they're not men who become an active campaign inside the prison, in challenging the authorities inside the prison. The exception to that is Francis Sheehy Skeffington. And I suppose it's not a surprise that Francis Sheehy Skeffington should be the exception to that, because Francis Sheehy Skeffington obviously was married to Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, who was one of the leading suffragists, and therefore he's, he, it's not surprising his model would be the suffragettes rather than 19th century Irish nationalist prisoners. Okay? So he does go on strike in June 1915, uh, first of all on hunger strike, and then he escalates it to a hunger and curse strike, and the authorities reluctantly release him after five days on hunger and curse strike. Okay? Um, this is one of the things to be emphasised as we go along here. Uh, we now know, uh, those of us who have lived through, for instance, the 1980s know, know that people can live for a very, very long time on hunger strike. And subsequently they would learn that with Terence McSweeney when that test comes in 1920. But they had no sense of that at all in 1915. So as soon as those suffragettes went into prison, or Francis Sheehy Skeffington went into prison, they really expected that their lives were, were in danger within three or four days. Okay? All right? Uh, so, that's, uh, so that's one of the others. Okay. So in other words, then, I suppose, before going on, there are now sort of two models of imprisonment operating in Ireland uh, uh, before we get to the 1916 Rising. There's the old model drawing on the Fenians of going to prison, propagandising around it, organising around it, accepting the title of martyrdom, and there's the newer model of challenging the state while in prison. Okay. Uh, obviously, we're talking about very small numbers uh, up, up until now. That changes with the 1916 Rising. In the weeks before the 1916 Rising, Dublin Castle considered jailing about a hundred suspects, who they identified as key suspects, and using the Defence of the Realm Act to do it. But they didn't do it. They thought, there's no way these people are mad enough to have a rising, basically, was their logic. Okay? So if we jail them, we may just provoke trouble. So let's not jail them. Okay? And they didn't. And it was a mistake, because there was a rising. Okay? And so, in the immediate aftermath of the rising, they then proceeded to make the exact opposite mistake, which was they jailed too many people. Okay, all right. Which is an understandable mistake to make if the, your previous mistake is jailing too few. Okay. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of the rising, they arrest around three and a half thousand people. Okay. Um, 
That's a lot of people because, depending on whose figures you believe, someplace between 1,500 and 1,800 people actually participated in the rise. Okay? So they're arresting lots of people who they, around the country who they suspect may be sympathetic, who, has, who have been on their files, maybe for some activity seven or eight years earlier and have long since abandoned their association with any radical nationalism, and yet they're picking them up from the aftermath of the rise. The prisoners are, have, there are more or less two separate experiences in the aftermath of the rising. There are those who were convicted by court martial. Okay? And as you all know, 15 of those were executed uh, over in Kilmainham. Okay? But 141 of them are given prison sentences and they are sent to prison in England uh, to Dartmoor, to Portland, and to Wormwood Scrubs. Okay? And they are treated as convicts and many of them are penal servitude prisoners, so they initially have a very harsh prison regime okay, in the initial phases. The other group, a much bigger group, initially somewhere over 2,000, are uh, sort of, they pass through Richmond Barracks, they are sifted, and then they are sent on, on cattle ships, across the Irish Sea, to various detention centres, and they're held under the Defence of the Act. They're not tried, they're interned without trial. Okay. Uh, initially they were held in about eight or nine small separate uh, holding centres where they experienced quite a harsh regime. But then, after a number of weeks, there was a loosening up of their regime and they were sent to, uh, where these postcards are from, uh, Frongoch Camp in, in North Wales. Uh, and in Frongoch, by the middle of the summer, there are about 1,800 internees there, there or there or thereabouts. Okay. Um, a very small number of the internees are not sent to Frongoch, they're sent to Radian Jail because they are regarded as the leadership of that group and they're regarded as potential troublemakers within the camp. So they separate them. This idea of isolating again, which is very typical. Okay. All right. So after the initial... So there's an easing, really, in, of the regime in Frongoch. Uh, the prisoners are more or less kept inside. Once they stay inside the wa wire, they can more or less organise their own lives. They organise football competitions, they organise concerts, they organise military <laughs> drill, they organise Irish lessons, they organise music lessons. Um, a lot of this is trying to stay off boredom as much as anything else. Okay, no way. Um, and there's a, the debate about, there's a debate among them how they should respond to the authorities. And I'll t talk about this a little, maybe in, in a second. So a reasonably comfortable regime insofar as it can be comfortable if you've got 1,800 people all jammed together in huts in a camp, okay? All right. Uh, towards the end of 1916, the authorities also ease off, under pressure from the Irish Parliamentary Party, ease off on the regime that the convicts are experiencing. And they move them from Dartmoor and Portland, and they gather them together in a prison called Lewis, and they basically give them a privileged regime, very like first-class misdemeanant mis 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 regime that I was talking about earlier. Okay? So that means they get a better diet, they can converse with each other, they can work together, they can exercise together. Okay? All right. After that phase of easing conditions, there follows almost inevitably, and this happens again and again to the authorities, they make this mistake again and again, as soon as they collect lots of prisoners together in a space and ease their conditions and allow them to interact and communicate with each other, they start to organise each other. Okay? And conflict follows as soon as night follows day. Okay? All right. And so that happens in Frongoch in very late 1916. Over, there are a couple of issues over what work might be expected from the internees, on the one hand. And the second issue is that some of those internees had been living in England before the rising. And because they'd been living in England before the rising, they were liable to conscription, technically under the law. And the authorities of the camp, very foolishly, try and identify these internees and pull them out of the camp and put them into the British Army. Why you'd want to put a rebel into the British Army, I'm not sure, but nonetheless, they, they, they decide that we're going to do this. And the, the response from the prisoners is to rebel, to refuse to identify those, um, those men, and a strike begins in the camp. Okay? Uh, and there's, uh, the, the, the condition, the relationship between the, camp, the prisoners and the camp authorities break down. One of the consequences of that is the camp doctor who's caught in the middle uh, commits suicide because he feels 
under pressure from the authorities not to treat rebelling prisoners, and he feels under pressure from the prisoners to treat them, and they're sending letters to Parliament, etc., about, uh, about their conditions. All right. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize across all of this experience is there's a tendency to talk about the united action of prisoners and how this was a great stand we made together. That tends to be the retrospective memory of the prisoners. But one thing that has to be noted is all, in almost every prison situation, there are those, there are divisions among the prisoners. Uh, whether it be about the tactics, whether it be divisions based on personality, sometimes it's division based on geography, <coughs> there are all sorts of reasons. Uh, it, uh, but this happens in almost every place, and it happens in Brongot, where a large number of the prisoners don't want to participate in the protests that some of the radicals, like Michael Collins, for instance, is driving inside the camp. Okay, right? <coughs> um, another thing about which there is conflict quite often is whether or not one should cooperate with authorities and take parole. And say, for instance, I will agree to my release on the basis that I will no longer act against the state. Okay? Whether that's an acceptable thing to do. And you know, very often the authorities among the prisoners would, would say that's absolutely omerta. One shouldn't do that. But reg and they would say it never happened. But in actual fact, in Frangok it did. There were prisoners who took parole on that basis. And this, it, it happens regularly, even though the, the leaders of the Irish volunteers of the IRA would regularly say that it didn't. Okay? So there are those divisions. Last thing before I move on from 1916 to say is one of the things that's absolutely crucial about 1916 is the organisation around the prisoners outside. Okay? And in the immediate aftermath of the rising, a number of groups are set up to support the prisoners. Uh, there's a group called the Irish Volunteer Dependence Fund, which is largely driven by relatives of the prisoners uh, and relatives of people who were executed. Kathleen Clark, for instance, is very involved with that. Uh, so they are clear about what they want. This is to support the prisoners, and it's not just to support the prisoners, but it's a vehicle for driving the cause on. There's a group called the Irish National Aid Association, which is a more mixed group. It's, they sort of present themselves as philanthropic. So you don't have to commit yourself to the politics of the prisoners, but yet you might be sympathetic to their circumstance in prison. Okay? All right? And then, uh, for instance, in England, there's a parallel group called the Irish National Relief Fund, which is organised, which goes and visits people in the prisons and organises they get Christmas hampers. Okay? Right. That's very important because those are, eventually the Irish National Aid Organization, uh, Association and the Volunteers Dependence Fund will amalgamate into one organisation. And there's a sort of reverse takeover. Even though the radical group is much smaller, they eventually control the amalgamated group. Okay? And they use it uh, very effectively as a way uh, of creating an organisational structure for those radical activists who remain uh, free at a moment when all their other organisational structures have been smashed in the aftermath of the rise. They use it as a way of getting people, giving people a way of dipping their toe in involvement. You know, collecting money for prisoners could be the first step. You know, uh, uh, it could be like, you know, if you, what's, the, what's that, the language used about drug taking? It's a sort of the entry drug, so to speak. You know what I mean? You, you, you collect for prisoners first, and maybe then you associate with people around it, and you get interested, and you take the next step, and you become actively involved in more radical stuff. Um, uh, the other thing they do is they support conflict inside. So unlike Frank Moss, who nobody knows about, they help ensure that when the prisoners want to generate conflict inside, that the news of it will be spread outside. And for instance, they will ask, ensure the questions are asked in Parliament, and the prisoners inside who are getting hands hard in are going, oh look, they've just asked a question about this in Parliament, because we've, because we've done this, let's do something else, and we'll get another question asked in Parliament. So there's this mutual feeding going on between the support groups and, uh, and those inside. It's here, in this period as well, that the prisoners begin to be used for electoral advantage. Okay? And this is a very important uh, element here. Uh, prisoners are used by Sinn Féin later and by other groups to try and make an impact in elections. But also, going to prison for many people is a way into having a political career. Okay? All right? So those, those two things are, are, are happening. Okay? Um, the first person, a very famous one in this case, is there's a by-election in uh, Longford in April-May 1917, 
uh, where a man called Joe McGuinness is reluctantly put on the ticket by what will become Sinn Féin, and he wins, just about, and the slogan under which he wins is, put him in to get him out. Okay? So in other words, put him into the parliament to get him out of prison. Okay, so slogan. All right. Uh, the release of all those prisoners happens. <laughs> the internees, I should say, are released just before Christmas 1916. And the convicts are released after organising a riot in Lewis Prison in uh, the summer of 1917. Okay? All right. So, that brings us to... I'll have to get past the point of these phases. Okay. Uh, the next phase is a phase uh, which the press report is a phase of hunger strike mania. And you'll notice that so there was a very brief hunger strike in front of <coughs> only last two days. It's, you know, uh, it's a minor uh, effort at Irish nationalists using uh, hunger strike. But from the autumn of 1917, Irish volunteer prisoners start to use hunger strike as a really effective weapon. And what they're doing from the summer of 1917 is they're drilling. In other words, they're marching in uniform around various parts of Ireland, defying the state. And actually, they're inviting the state to imprison them. Okay. They're many of them are deliberately want to be imprisoned. Michael Brennan from Clare, who's a leader of the Irish Volunteers in Clare, is very explicit about this. He said, we drilled so they would imprison us. And then when we get into prison, we can then use the prison against them by hunger strike. Okay? So this is the strategy they use in these months. Okay? Uh, again, it starts off with one or two doing it. One of the first people to do it was Tyg Barry, who was a trade union activist again, and who was an Irish volunteer from Cork. And I think that link between being able to point back to saying, well, it was okay for Connolly to do it, so therefore I can do it, is important here. It, it, I think it would be harder for them. They would be more reluctant to do this if they perceived it only <coughs> as a female strategy. Okay? So it's important to them that there is a sort of male trade union lineage for them into which they can uh, operate. Okay? Uh, first major hunger strike happens in Mount Joy in September 1920, and it's the hunger strike. Uh, these photographs uh, are. I put them up as definitely so, but I have my doubts. They are supposed to be photographs of hunger strikers from 1917 being uh, brought out of Mount Joy. This is certainly a photograph of Thomas Ashe. And Thomas Ashe dies on hunger strike in uh, September 1917 uh, while being forced to be fed. Okay. Uh, uh, he experiences a heart attack while being forced to be fed, probably as a direct consequence of the forcible feeding. Uh, he is then moved across to the Mater Hospital where he dies in the Mater Hospital later that year. And one of the things that does is it, uh, by the way, they're hunger striking for, as always, for improved conditions. For the sense that we are particular types of prisoners and therefore we should be treated in a particular way. Okay, that's their demand. Um, in the aftermath of his death, there's a huge propaganda victory for the Irish volunteers. Uh, there's an enormous funeral here in which Michael Collins said basically we, take, we took over the city for a weekend around the funeral. Okay? And then following that, his inquest takes a month. There are a series of hearings over a month. And day after day, there are reports in the newspapers about the torturing of Thomas Ashe and the torturing of the prisoners in Mount Joy. Okay? Um, and which is a, a huge boon to the Irish volunteers. And it, it encourages lots of people to join and to become involved. Um, what the state does in the aftermath is it concedes. It concedes improved conditions to the prisoners. Okay? And the other thing they do is they decide to abandon forcible feeding. So they, forcible feeding has got them into this trouble, it's killed a prisoner, so they decide they're not going to do it anymore. That leaves an obvious problem. How do you deal with hunger strikers if you don't have the weapon of forcible feeding? Well, you either leave them starve, which they don't want to do because they've already seen the disaster of leaving a, having a prisoner die, so they release. So there's a whole series of hunger strikes from the autumn of 1917 through to early March 1918, where again and again, groups of volunteers defy the state by volunteering, get themselves jailed, then defy the state inside the, uh, the jails by hunger striking, and are out within days. Imagine how demoralizing this is for the state. They've effectively reduced the police and the prisons to redundancy for a number of months in late 1917, early 1918. The state responds by doing the only thing that's left to them, the logical response, which is, they say, well, we will allow you to starve yourself. 
Okay? So they threatened to allow prisoners to starve themselves to death. In this, eventually, in late February, early March 1918, and in response, the prisoners actually, the prisoners concede the point. And there's a, an agreement cobbled together where they, uh, they agree an identified regime in which the prisoners will be held, the prisoners abandon hunger strike, and they also agree a process by which those special political prisoners will be identified. Right. That leads then to a period from the summer of 1918 through the summer of 1919 where there's very little hunger strike and where the prisoners have to use other tactics uh, to try and disrupt the state. Um, there are two major groups of prisoners in this period. There are a group who are sometimes called the German plot prisoners. Effectively, they are, uh, they're interned and they're interned in Britain and they are high-level leadership of Sinn Féin, De Valera, Arthur Griffith, uh, etc., all in, interned in, in, from uh, May 1918. And actually, they're very quiet prisoners. They're very amenable prisoners. They, they have a very nice regime, and they don't cause too much trouble for the authorities. Okay? But in Ireland, there's still trouble going on. And the trouble is going on, and it begins in Dundalk and Belfast. Uh, so, and it's, again, the same problem that I identified earlier. Okay, so they've come to an agreement with these prisoners. They've given them an ameliorated regime. They can sit together in two prisons in Ireland, in Dalton and Belfast. They can communicate with each other, and they can say, well, how are we going to cause trouble next? Okay, all right. And they, they start off by doing very small, petty little triumphs, like, for instance, when Dermot Lynch, who's being held in Dundalk, wants to get paroled to go out and get married, and he's refused it, they sneak his wife-to-be and a priest and a witness into the prison, and they marry him in the prison. Okay, all right. Um, but then they go on in the summer of 1918, in June 1918, there's a riot in Belfast prison where they uh, cause serious damage to one of the wings in Belfast prison. They used as a pretext uh, a reduction in their diet because of the wartime situation. The state reduces diets across all the prisons because of the lack of food during the war. And they say, well, that's not good enough. And so they, they riot as a consequence. Okay? And then, again, there follows, there's the riot, and the riot is put down, there's loads of propaganda about how cruelly the riot was put down, and how they were held in handcuffs for days, and how they were held in handcuffs even while going to mass, and you get this cycle going in propaganda. Okay. It's quiet again for a few months, and then in late 1918, a very important social, uh, <coughs> I suppose, uh, what's the word, social event, event's not quite the right word, but... Uh, uh, factor in Irish people's lives in 1918 1919 in Ireland is influenza. And thousands and thousands of people are dying of influenza across Ireland. And it's a huge a pandemic across the world in 1918 1919. More people die of influenza on the Western Front in 1918 than die actually from mm -hmm. being you know, shot or, or, or uh, any other way. Okay? Uh, and so there's an outbreak of influenza in Belfast prison in late 1918. And as a consequence, the authorities give them an even better regime. But the pro until they recover is the idea. But the problem then is they've got to remove the even better regime from them once they're recovered. And the prisoners refuse that and they use it as a pretext to have a riot. And there's another, there's a riot here. Um, through the spring of 1919, they use a number of tactics. They, they ridicule is a very important strategy for the prisoners. Like that, you know, managing to get a Dermot Lynch married in prison. And one of the key ways in which you can bring the system into ridicule is to escape from it. Okay? And so there are a series of escapes in uh, the spring of 1918. Uh, two of them out of the Mount Joy. Robert Barton they, uh, disappears in the middle of the night on the 16th, 17th of March, uh, 1919. Uh, and uh, only a few days later, 20 men managed to get over the wall of Mount Joy and out. Okay? And the authorities look ridiculous because, as a consequence of this. Um, Another thing they do is concerted campaigns of disobedience. They just refuse to obey the prison laws and wear the prison garb and answer to the prison authorities when they're supposed to in various ways. Okay. So that plan carries on through the summer of 1919. That's tough going if you're a prisoner. It's small, petty contests, and it goes on for a long time. And, it's, and you're not getting huge propaganda results from it. That's hard work, okay, all right? And so, from the autumn of 1919, you get a return to hunger strike. 
Uh, and the prisoners are facilitated in this basically because the authorities are, are very disorganized at this, at this point. They flip-flop, they're indecisive, and when hunger striking restarts in late autumn 19, 19, 1919, they start to release prisoners again. The prisoners logically go, okay, they're releasing us again, and so they begin another series of hunger strikes. And that sort of reaches a crescendo in late March, April, May 1920, when first William O'Brien, again the leader of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, who's an internee in Wormwood Scrubs at the time, launches a hunger strike, and they re he's released within a number of days. That's followed <coughs> by a large number of prisoners, over 90 prisoners in Mount Joy, who go on hunger strike in, in April 1920. And Dublin Castle make a complete mess of trying to manage the strike and end up releasing over 90 prisoners in April uh, 1920. Uh, and obviously, this has been a success for them. So over 200 internees go on hunger strike in Wormwood Scrubs in May 1920 and released again. So the authorities are now, in the spring of 1920, back where they were in the spring of 1918. There's no point in arresting people, there's no point in putting them in prison, because they're just hunger strike and they will get out. Okay? All right? So, they do what they did before. Uh, they say, uh, we are going to have to uh, insist on holding the line. And they do that from the summer of 1920. And this is part of a general escalation of the situation in Ireland from the summer of 1920. Violence has really kicked off from the spring of 1920. People are now regularly getting shot in the streets at this point. So the, the, I suppose, uh, the extent of the conflict in the prison mirrors the fact that conflict has escalated outside at this period. Uh, for instance, the authorities inter introduced legislation in August 1920 called the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act, which gives them lots of powers. And so when in August 1920 a group of prisoners go on hunger strike in Cork, the authorities decide they are going to hold the line. One of those prisoners is Terence McSweeney, who's the Lord Mayor of Cork. Within a few days of the beginning of his strike, they transfer him to Brixton Prison in London. And his contest with the authorities, which lasts 74 days, uh, is played out in London where the international media can have full access to it and there's the most, it's the event in Ireland or around Ireland in 1920 which gets the most coverage from the international press and it's a huge success even though obviously McSweeney dies it's a huge propaganda success for um, uh, the, the IRA and the Irish Volunteers. Less well remembered are the group who are on hunger strike in Cork at the same time in parallel. Okay. 11 of them stay on hunger strike for the whole period that McSweeney does, and two of them die. A man called Michael Fitzgerald dies uh, a week before McSweeney, in fact, on the 17th of October, uh, 1920, and on the same day McSweeney dies, a young man called Joe Murphy dies in Cork Prison. And it's a quite strange thing to look at the newspaper reports of the day after. There are pages and pages and pages in terms of McSweeney, and Joe Murphy gets these tiny little amount of coverage. <coughs> So this is a big success in one way. There's a huge amount of propaganda gained. The authorities' legitimacy is undermined. They look like they are an extraordinarily harsh, illegitimate state in Ireland because of the way they act against McSweeney. But for the downside for the, for the volunteers, well, there's, you, there's, you know, there's limited returns to this. The consequences are terrible, and you're never going to generate the same propaganda again. You can only really pull this trick off once, if pulling this trick off is not an unfair way of describing what happens. Okay? And so, actually, in the aftermath of McSweeney, hunger strikes fall off. There are far fewer hunger strikes. There are occasional hunger strikes, but they never last for very long, and they don't develop into the contest that they did, until you get to the Civil War. What does happen, though, between November 1920 and the summer of 1921, as the state ratchets its up its uh, response, is two things. From the 1st of November 1920, the state starts to execute prisoners. Executes Kevin Barry, the first person executed since the 1916 Rising, was executed on the 1st of November 1920. And in the months after, there will be 23 further executions uh, at Mountjoy, Cork, and Limerick prisons. Okay? So that brings a certain atmosphere to the country and a certain atmosphere to the prisons. The awareness that now, if arrested and prosecuted and convicted, one might be executed. Okay? All right. 
Uh, the other development is in response to the worsening situation outside, for instance, in response specifically to the disaster, which is Bloody Sunday, and the deaths which occur on that day in November 1920, the state introduced widespread internment. And it starts to use mass internment, and it opens up camps in Ballykinlar County Down, in the Curran County Kildare, on Spike Island, on Bear Island, and there are some smaller ones as well. And over the next several months, they would intern well over 3,000 people in those camps. Um, uh, those camps, the regimes are, uh, again, they're like Frankreich, you know. Uh, it's about keeping the prisoners inside and they more or less organise their, their lives inside. Uh, they're not pleasant and they're less pleasant during the winter when, they, when it's cold and wet, but um, they're, they're, the prisoners are treated reasonably, reasonably well, okay? There are, however, occasions in which prisoners die in those camps. There are uh, four occasions in which prisoners are shot. Uh, in, uh, in each occasion, the authorities suggest that those prisoners are trying to escape, or they're, or they're breaking the rules in some egregious ways in which it forced the sentry to shoot them. Uh, the arguments of, on, on the behalf of the army there are largely unsustainable in all those cases. Um, the names of the people are two guys called Sloan and Tommy from Westmead, um, a man called Patrick White, from Clare, who shot on Spike Island. Actually, he's leaning through the fence to try and pick up a schlitter, which has gone through the, gone through the wire fence. Uh, and Tyg Barry, who we mentioned way back as one of the early hunger strikers, is shot in Ballykinlar towards the end of winter. We're nearly there, I promise you. Okay. Um, the truce period, okay, is really interesting. Uh, it's one of the periods where you might expect, oh, well, you know, there's a... Tr the, there's a truce from the 11th of July, 1921, and a period of talks about talks start, and then a period of talks start from October, okay? And one of the things that happens in this period is uh, the prisoners think, particularly the internees, well, there's a truce. Obviously, the first thing that will happen is we'll get released, okay? But they're absolutely horrified to discover that even though the leadership are released out of the prisoners in the camp, uh, prisoners in the camps, to set about organising these talks and having the doll meetings to empower the federal potentiaries to go over, very few other people are. Okay. So there are these sets of prisoners who find that while the conditions of war have stopped outside and their leaders are out there, they're still stuck inside. Okay. And that leads to a good deal of conflict between the prisoners and their own leadership. Okay. And it leads to a good deal of upset among the communities, the families of those prisoners. Okay. during that period of the truce. Um, and as a plan, for instance, uh, there are, the, regularly, the leadership of the uh, IRA have to go into the prisons and camps and calm the prisoners down and tell them to stop rioting or to stop trying to organise a hunger strike. And usually they're told, well, that's all very well for you to say, but you're out and we're here. Okay? All right. um, one of the other things that uh, happens during this period is that the prison, those who are managing the prison, prisons, the warders, the governors, are increasingly aware, hang on, it's quite likely that we've been holding all these people who are now going to be, it looks like there'll be a settlement, it looks like there'll be an independent Ireland, it looks like these people will be running the independent Ireland, and we're here stuck holding them in prisons for the last few months, okay? As you can imagine, that causes a good deal of concern among the warders and the governors. And the discipline starts to break down in the prison service in Ireland during that period, precisely because they feel very, very vulnerable, uh, the authorities at that point within the prisons. Okay. Um, with, the with the treaty, on the 6th of December 1921, uh, the releases begin. Uh, first of all, all the internees release within days, almost immediately. They don't release the convicts for a while. Uh, they hold the convicts as a sort of bargaining chip until the Dáil has passed the treaty. Okay. And when the Dáil has passed the treaty, then most of the convicts get out. Okay. And a, a number of times during the Dáil debates around the treaty, the convicts are mentioned. You know, we've got to get on and decide what we're going to do because there are all these men and women who are sitting in prison waiting for us to decide. Okay. Um, there are a number of other groups who are held for a little while longer. For instance, anyone who had, broke, who had managed to get themselves arrested during the truce for doing something to break the truce, they're held for a little while longer. Uh, people who had 
uh, been involved in rebellious activity in England are held for longer. They are not immediately released. Uh, a group called the Connacht Rangers, who were a group of soldiers who had rebelled in India uh, when they heard about, they were in the British Army and they rebelled in India, when they heard about the news back home, and, and they were in prison and they were held for longer because the attitude was, well, you were the British uniform when you acted, but that's a different matter entirely. That's treason, we're not going to release you. And there was a period of negotiation around getting them out. And uh, there's another guy called uh, Dowling, who had been one of the men that um, oh, my head is, Roger Casey had recruited in Germany in, in uh, late 15, early 16. Uh, and again, he's regarded as a man who'd been in British uniform when he had betrayed, and therefore they hold him for longer. And there's a last little group, there are three men who are involved in trying to organise an escape out of Derry prison during the truce. And as these, uh, in trying to organise the escape, probably accidentally, they give too much chloroform to two of the warders they're trying to knock out in this when they're trying to escape, and they kill them. And as a consequence, they, there's a great reluctance to release those men. Okay? It's eventually 1926 before those three men uh, who were involved in the attempted Derry escape were released. Usually what happens is those people, on, individuals who I've talked about, are released every time there's a sort of an agreement about something being thrashed out between the new Irish and British state, whether it be about British use of, for instance, wireless facilities for their naval services. They'd say, oh yeah, we'll give you that, but you know that from the Dowling, will you leave them out? And they go, okay. Right? Okay. So that's the kind of exchange that goes on during that period. Okay, I'm going to spend two minutes on this, and I, in warning again, that I'm not as, uh, uh, really an expert on civil war uh, imprisonment as, as much as I am on the earlier period. Um, as I mentioned, actually the numbers involved are actually much bigger. There are almost 12,000 people imprisoned uh, at the end of the civil war in Ireland. And again, they're held across a varied, what might be called, archipelago of incarceration. So there are prisons. Uh, the North Dublin Union Workhouse, for instance, is taken over and used as a place to hold women prisoners during this period. Uh, there are a series of camps, again, opened up around the country. Uh, the Curra in Gormanstown in Mead uh, to hold, uh, to hold uh, prisoners. Um, Generally speaking, it seems an actual fact that the regimes under which the civil war prisoners were held were harsher than the regimes under which the Irish prisoners were held by the British during the earlier phases of the revolutionary period. In part, that seems to be a consequence of the numbers, I would say. It's just the sheer volume. Trying to hold 12,000 people in, in reasonable conditions is, is difficult. Okay, all right, so that part of the reason. Partly it may be fed by that bitterness which comes with the civil war. Partly it's because the people who are holding them have been to prison before, they've used all the strategies of a political prisoner, and they're not prepared to tolerate those strategies being used against them. They're saying, look, we know your tricks, forget it, we're not going to, we're not going to concede to them. Okay? And the other thing, perhaps, is that issue of legitimacy. And the support from outside. During the War of Independence, it's very clear that the prisoners will garner immediately general support from the general nationalist population. It's not that clear that the Civil War prisoners can generate that kind of support uh, in their contest between what is now an Irish state and, and, and themselves. Does that, does that make sense to you? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I suppose uh, a couple of points to make, last couple of points to make about the Civil War experience is uh, that executions are used far more widely during that period as well than they were during the, during the Irish War of Independence. Uh, the famous figure of Paul Robert now again is 77, and there's some dispute about that somewhat, but roughly speaking. Um, and executions are used very much as a strategy, a sort of count, as, the, as the state would have seen as a sort of basic counter-terror strategy in that period. If you're going to cause trouble, we're just going to execute, and we're going to use you as examples of what we will continue to do until you stop. Um, the prisoners also try to use hunger strike during this period, and they use it very ineffectively. The state's not prepared to concede to them, uh, but also they make a mistake of organising a mass hunger strike. So they, go, uh, uh, they try and organise every single person who is in prison. At this point, there are something around 8,000 of them to go on hunger strike. That's a bad hunger strike strategy. 
You should always pick an elite who are prepared to stay on the hunger strike and are committed if you want your hunger strike to succeed. If you get everybody to go on a hunger strike, people will, the hunger strike will start crumbling comparatively quickly. And that's, that's, what, that's what happens. Okay. A couple of maybe general points then, just to conclude with. I hope I've demonstrated how important the prison experience is to the revolutionary experience how it interacts very closely with the rhythms of the revolution. And if the, if the experience of the prisoners is affected by what's happening outside, but also what the prisoners are doing affects the broader revolution. That's very important. It's, a, it's one of the key experiences of a revolutionary generation. It's the way they identify themselves as revolutionaries. I went to prison, and not only did I go to prison, but I rebelled in prison. It's, it's very much part of that identity of the revolutionaries. It's key to the propaganda of the revolution, uh, as we've seen over and over again. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, one of the things that's important about it is, is that it's a Sinn Féin strategy, is to destroy the British state in Ireland. And that's really what their strategy is. And they do that by, for instance, attacking the RIC, and they do it by attacking the court systems. Then one of the ways that hasn't been recognised enough that they attack an arm of the state is they reduce the prison system to almost an inability to function for large stretches of this period. And that's a huge success for them in the revolution. Right, thanks very much for listening to our Of course, and any questions at all, I'm more than two, two, two seconds, two seconds. I'd just, uh, just like to review at the end, just uh, for the audience, my, my custom. Very, very briefly, hold that thought. Uh, so just to recap very briefly, what Will has argued here today is that the modern, modern experience of political imprisonment in Ireland started with the suffragettes, the movement for women's uh, suffrage, for women's votes, continued through the 1913 lockout where James Byrne died in hunger strike. Um, he's argued that after the 1916 rising in particular, this was adopted by nationalist republican prisoners, and that this was reached its high point, its apogee, during the War of Independence, but that during the Civil War, where by contrast the numbers were much larger, it actually failed. So with that recap, I'm happy to take questions. So go ahead there. First one, um, Marlborough prison. Mm. You didn't mention it at all. I didn't at all. No. Where does it come? I mean, where does it come? Is it in the Civil War or is it the War of Independence? Uh, it's both. Uh, it's both. Um, Marlborough, uh, modern day Port Leash, is, is, uh, is used uh, during the, uh, during the re early, early, early revolutionary phase. So let's... From late 1918 and early 1919, that period of hunger strikes that I talk about, there are prison court protests there uh, in, in, in Marlborough. And it's, it's the British. It's against the it's British. Against the British state. Yeah, it's the British state. It's yeah. used there. Um, for instance, in early 1919, when uh, the Iron Frontiers try and organise that strategy of incremental protests, of organised protests, something less than hunger strike, but still constant protests. Uh, one of the ways in which the state finds out that they're doing that is that uh, there's a cake delivered into Marlborough Prison with the order inside in the cake. And they put the cake up and uh, here presto out comes order to the prisoners that you're to engage in concerted protests. So it's been used then. Uh, it's used uh, very significantly during the truce period when the internees on Spike Island, because of their disgruntlement, had not been released organise a strike, during which they basically pull all the, the huts on the island apart, they burn several of them down, they reduce the camp out to chaos, and uh, all those internees are then shifted in actual fact to Marlborough in that period during the troops that are down there. And then, as you say, it's reused again by Free State during the Civil War. It's an important site for uh, imprisonment during the Civil War as well by, by the Free State. But as I say, I know less about that than I knew. And the Free State then. also used Mount Joy. It did, yes. Uh, the, the Free State used all the you know, prisons across the country, so it's using Mar Marla, it's using Dundalk, it's using Sligo, uh, it's using Limerick and Cork, um, uh, and it then is, is adding to that, because that's simply not enough, as you can imagine, all the 12,000 prisoners that have, so they're adding to that by, they used the name, which I should have mentioned, um, um, and as I said, the they get the board of works to prepare the North London Union workhouse to them, and they set up the camps like this, as the British did. They set up the intern the various internment camps around. And the British the British use Mount Joy and Kilmain. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Uh, Kilmain actually been shut down. 
One of the things about the Irish prison system is that it was actually getting smaller in the years before the, before the revolution. There had been an attempt to actually reduce the number of people who were being sent to prison and try and deal with convicts in different ways. And they closed down Montjoy, or sorry, not Montjoy, they closed down Kildare. <coughs> I think, don't, I could be wrong about this, but I think it's about 1906, 1907, they'd actually closed it down and had to reopen it as a direct consequence of, first of all, the 1916 rising and then later the other prisoners during the war. Okay, thank you very much. There's a question over here. Uh, if I'm very interesting, uh, you didn't mention the general strike in 1920 for the release. I didn't, no. Yeah, and the fourth point, I uh, know Ryan Weiss is here, we've written extensively on this particular topic, but the death of Robert de Bourne and Limerick, which led to the... I didn't mention that either, actually. Yeah, so yeah. there's been a lot of labour uh, yeah. events surrounding the issue of prisoners. So Absolutely. Right Absolutely. Well, uh, obviously, Bobby Byrne is a, a, he's an, he's a trade unionist and an Irish volunteer. Uh, he's part of that period where I talked about there was escapes. Uh, and effectively, he goes on hunger strike. He's actually breaking the orders of the Irish volunteer leadership by going on hunger strike in that period in early 1919 because uh, they're not supposed to be doing so. But he does it, and he's released out of the prison. Um, the, the prison hospital can't cope, hasn't got medical facilities to cope with a hunger strike. And there's influenza in Mount Joy, so they can't send anyone to Mount Joy, so they're forced to release them out into the workhouse hospital. But when they release them out into the workhouse hospital, something very interesting happens. One of the things I don't mention is the, the position of I mentioned the bit, the position of medical officers is very interesting. Um, the medical officers in the workhouse, their employers now are nationalists who've been elected onto local government. Okay? And they know that their bosses don't want them to say, oh Bobby Burman is he's, he's recovered, you can send him back to prison. And so they don't, they never say he's ready to go back to prison. And as a consequence of that, he's sitting in the workhouse and the prison authorities are getting more and more worried that there's going to be an attempt to, to organise an escape. And indeed there is, as you probably know, one Sunday afternoon when a group of volunteers break into the ward of the hospital and they try and rescue him. And there's effectively a shootout. And Byrne is shot and dies shortly afterwards. Uh, and one of these guards is shot and killed as well during that shootout. And that funeral. And the state's response to that funeral leads the trade unions in Limerick to organise what's subsequently called the Limerick Soviet, where they essentially try to take control of the city for a number of days after that. Yeah, part of organising support outside, you talk about that Mountjoy hunger strike in April um, 1920. Uh, one of the body groups, uh, the, the civic society groups, which are very important for the volunteers to organise around them and to assist them. If they're going to put the state under sufficient pressure, pressure to release prisoners, Aaron is the trade union movement. And the trade union movement organised a, a, a day's general strike in support of that, uh, uh, in, in support of that hunger strike. Um, and it's very effective because one of the things it does is hunger strikes or executions, those sort of events in prisons, they make, this, is kind of, this may seem like a silly way of putting this, but they make the prison seem bigger within the space which is the city. Suddenly, the prison comes to dominate the city. And the reason the prison comes to dominate the city is because people start to congregate around the prisons during, uh, on the morning of an execution or during the events which is a hunger strike. And the general strike facilitates that in a very important way because people aren't, you know, they're, they're, they're not at work and so when while not being at work, they all come to the prison and gather around the prison, and there's a sense, it increases the sense of siege under which the prison authorities feel. And it's a very important element to achieve that, that release. And I think, as I mentioned, as I was going along, the trade union activists, I think, are a very important link, particularly in the taking on of hunger strike by the nationalists. I think if it hadn't been for those trade union uh, activists, the nationalists might have been slower about taking on a home strike as a strategy. Okay, there's two questions. I'm going to take this one, this one, and then I'll come down the front here. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, are there any record or comprehensive records available of all of the people, so an awful lot of people who were in prison from 1920 to 1922, 1923? Yeah. I, I asked that because um, in my own family, my grandfather, the historian of the family, I've never made a bottom of it, allegedly spent time in prison trying to blow up the bridge and move them or something like that. Like, it could be a complete myth, yeah. and I've, I've never been able to get to the bottom of it. Yeah. In terms of it. Is there any kind of comprehensive record? Yeah, they're, they're very, very good. This is one of the blessings and courses of my project. Right. Uh, there were 
lots and lots of records. Oh, right. okay? uh, so, um, National Archives has the records of the General Prison Board of Ireland. Now, unfortunately, they have never been catalogued by modern archivists. Okay? So you have to use the old ledgers. Find your way to the old ledgers. So it's, a, it's a somewhat, it's not an e as easy a process as if the modern archivists have got their hands on them. But nonetheless, there are very extensive general prison yeah. there. And there are, for instance, the... Was that like the War of Independence and the Civil War? Uh, for both. For both, yeah. For both. Uh, and um, there are not just those, but there are, for instance, there would be the, the... The prison ledgers are also available, you know, the, the, the ledgers people would sign from the end chart and, you know, all the details that would be taken about that, whether they're addressed, their identity, and all those, all those can, be, can be obtained. Um, you do, so that's if he's imprisoned in Ireland. Um, there are also lots of records out in. Uh, John says you've seen some of these. There are lots yeah. of records out in the military archives, out about mines around people, particularly who were imprisoned during the Civil War. Yeah, actually, was he was he imprisoned for the thing in December '22 in Lucan? We don't know. If you if you do go to Collins to Colin Bro Barracks, there's a massive ledger of all the people arrested in Dublin. Like there's people arrested everywhere, but there's a, there's a huge le ledger of the ones arrested in Dublin. And there's over there's over three thousand names. And what happened was they were arrested and they were processed through what, what was then Wellington Barracks, later Griffith Barracks, yeah. and then they were sent to various internment camps and prisons. But there is a record of each name where he was arrested, when he was transferred from Wellington to the Curra or Hormonstown, wherever it was. So yeah, the, the records do exist. Now, the way things were in the Civil War, things did get a bit chaotic, and especially in, in the 30s, coming in when we were doing the election, ordered the Pope to up a load of documents from the Civil War, so they were afraid of it could get in the hand of their former enemies. So he may have slipped through the cracks, but for imprisonment, they're very good records, yeah. Ed, another question in the back there? Yeah, just two, two points. One is that describing the events from 1916-22 as a revolution, I, I, I'd be uneasy about that, actually. Given what Conway said about changing the flags over government. Yes. The second thing is, you know, <coughs> all this stuff about the prison and all the rest of it. You know, sure, sure, sure. All the tactics were interesting and you, you laid those out very well. But, but what was the sort of then, or was there any intellectual firm to questioning of the way forward, etc., etc.? For instance, in more contemporary history, during the border campaign uh, in the current, the people who were in charge of the current. Out of that experience, they did all those things, I'm sure, not hunger strike, but all the things to irritate the dark. Yeah. But out of it all came a rethinking, or an attempt to rethink the whole nationalist strategy and its defects and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. out, so it doesn't seem to have done so with the, the experience of imprisonment uh, in, in, from 16 to 22. And so we, <coughs> first of all, the revolution, and secondly, about you know, what was the development? I don't think there was any. I can, but you sure. With any of the of the yeah. second part. Uh, yeah, um, I have to say, I think the term revolution is, there certainly wasn't a social revolution in the sense that. Exactly. Well, that certainly didn't happen. Good. Okay. Um, however, there was a political revolution, maybe not a complete one as far as some people are concerned, but certainly was. Uh, the, the other thing is, I'm not sure that revolutions have to be successful. How many revolutions are ever actually successful? I'm not sure they actually have to be successful to be called a revolution. There was a revolutionary experience for these individuals. Many of them felt like they were participating in a process which was at least an attempt to change the society in which they lived. Uh, they were under, they were uh, involved in pretty extreme conflict to try, to try and achieve that change. It seems to me there was a revolutionary experience, even if there wasn't a revolutionary conclusion. It's a bit postmodernist for me now, that one. <laughs> it's a bit postmodernist. Look, there was a civil war in Finland. It was between the Reds and the Whites. It was a concrete issues, not about some sort of mystical oath, about real, true, concrete issues with regard to the working class and how they're going to live. You know, that's the important thing. And that's why I object, really, to, to calling it a revolution. A nationalist sort of struggle, fine, fine, Brits out of Brad. But just that, that's, that's the story, that's the truth. Story. Yes, well, no, not well, well, look, this boils down to very much, doesn't it, whether we just define that revolution as one type of thing, or whether it's where we're willing to concede that there might be various types of revolution. Well, that um, beyond me. <laughs> okay. uh, as to your second question, uh, was what were these spaces where there was sort of intellectual development? Yeah. 
um, which is typical among lots of political prisoners' experiences, uh, not just in, in Ireland, as you described in the 50s, but in you know, Poland and in Russia and various. Not a lot, there's some. Uh, there are, there are re there's rethinking of strategy again, which you, you would say is probably small potatoes compared to the big issues. Uh, while you're inside, you're thinking, well, did, did, for instance, at post-1916, well, that didn't work that time, so we have to rethink how, what we do when we go back out. But there are, for instance, there are spaces like in Mount Joy, uh, during the Civil War period, there very much is a group of Republican Socialists who are organising sort of a Republican Socialist reading group, thinking group, Pat O'Donnell and people like that are involved in that. And that, that is happening. Now, uh, you know, again, uh, you could argue that some of the developments from the 20s that O'Donnell was involved in might have grown out of those conversations, but you'd be stretching it a bit, I would, I would suggest. Okay? But, so, I suppose that's, that's my answer. Um, yeah, Mike, then here, and then I'll just switch up. There was about 3,000 men incarcerated towards the end, around the truce period. Is that...? About 3,000 in camps, and then about another 3,000 in various prisons. So, so about it's about 6,000. 6, about 6,000, and they were mainly held while the, the negotiations were being yeah. concluded, yeah. and then released out. What kind of effect did they... they they'd be a, a kind of a radical elite coming out, I presume. What kind of effect did they have on the larger society, and how much would that have contributed to, to, to the civil, civil war that happened after? Yeah, I mean, this is a very interesting question. I, I was very tempted. <laughs> I was very tempted to see with the, the divisions between the prisoners and their leadership during the truce period as some sort of prefiguring of the civil war division. And I'm not sure that it actually works. I'm not sure that uh, it feeds into it to some extent. Let's put it like this. Tom Barry, for instance, mm -hmm. down in Cork, is really horrified that during the truce, he's what's called the liaison officer between the Irish authorities and the British authorities. And they're trying to manage the truce. And one of the things he's got to try and do, he doesn't like this job at all. He doesn't think he should be talking to any British officer ever. And the other thing he really hates is when he's then being asked to go in to tell the prisoners, calm down, stop, you're not, you're to wait, the leaders will negotiate a settlement and everything will be fine, you'll be okay. He's completely unsatisfied with that and he encourages them in actual fact to rebel inside the prison and he breaks the orders of his own authorities uh, coming down the line to him. And that <coughs> probably ref does reflect what Tom Barry's attitude will be come the Civil War, if that makes sense. So maybe there's some prefiguring there. As to when they'll come back out, I'm not sure that I certainly couldn't make the case that a majority or a preponderance of those prisons who were held for longer come back out and end up prisons on the Republican side rather than on the Free State side. Uh, I'm not sure that I could uh, sustain, uh, sustain that argument at all. But I do, and, and one of the things I think it should be borne in mind around that is a lot of those people who are interned are the wrong people. You know, they're not actually radicals. One of the reasons they're really annoyed that they're still in prison during the truce is they never were radicals. And they couldn't understand why they were in an internment camp in the first place, and they certainly can't understand why they're in an why they were in an internment camp during the truce. Okay? So uh, so I would imagine most of those people just gratefully left the internment camp in December 1921 and settled back into their ordinary lives and didn't get involved in anything else at all. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, one, one comment on that. One of the differences between the War of Independence and the Civil War is in the War of Independence, the British generally have very poor intelligence. They had very poor contacts inside the IRA reformers, um, and they rest, They did big sweeps, especially in, in 1921. They did big sweeps through various areas and picked up a whole load of people for very flimsy reasons and returned them. Whereas in Civil War that happened as well, but they also got the right people. So there's a, there's a slight difference there. The Civil War is much more, the, the Free State in Civil War is much more effective at picking up the right people and imprisoning them from their point of view. Um, yeah, in the front here. This is on the revolution question. I mean, I think that, as you say, it's a political, basically a political revolution rather than a social revolution. And the uh, reference to that, of course, when we uh, say, uh, for example, in um, the, on the continent of the European continent in 1848, uh, the, there was a whole slew of re revolutions. Uh, I don't think any of them were, were except was partially successful in. in in France, but uh, you know, it certainly didn't change the uh, social order uh, anyway. Just uh, got rid of, finally got rid of the kings, which uh, 
and then of course later on the, the second Bonaparte took over. Uh, so uh, you know that would, would be it. It's a question of it's a question of uh, changing the uh, state by force, and from from that point of view, it was certainly you know even certainly a revolution uh, putting uh, remove to remove the uh, colonial state, which was backed by sections of the uh, uh, minority section of the bourgeoisie. Um, there was, uh, the, as you say, a possibility, and um, I think it's worth remarking that uh, here, the, to do it quickly, that the, uh, uh, that of course the uh, Sinn Féin leadership was pretty conscious of the danger from below, and uh, that uh, if you, while as uh, Emmett uh, O'Connor said a few weeks ago. De Valera never actually said Labour must wait. He uh, did the he and the Sinn Féin uh, other Sinn Féin leaders did work to see that Labour would wait. On the other hand, of course, the leadership of Labour was uh, with it, after Colony was uh, only too happy to uh, wait and expected uh, that it would come into its own uh, once this tiresome national question was removed. But there was a very specific mid, lower and middle layer of, of workers who, who did not see that, that difference and uh, struggled on it. And if you look at uh, things like all the, the stri general strikes, you see that they usually, except with the exception of the conscription strike in 1918, which uh, uh, you find that most of them were done uh, from outside the Labour leader, leadership uh, and, uh, you know, Put on to it for, for usually from below. Thank you much. Sorry, Good. friend, just very quickly, talking about jargon and semantics, apropos uh, these two gentlemen, um, I speaking to relatives of combatants in 1916. Apparently, the men who were involved themselves, they didn't like to refer to to 1916 as a rebellion mm. or a revolution. They spoke of it as a rising. Right. Yeah, could you differentiate for me the difference between Revolution, rebellion, rising. Very, very quickly, if you can, we're nearly out of time. Uh, here. They like to call it rising. Yeah. And then themselves. Uh, to be honest, I mean, <coughs> you, you will be better able to explain the attachment to the term rising itself. Uh, I, I want to clarify. I mean, I'm, I'm asking questions. I had de, a father who was in Mary, Mary Borough. And he went through, he was in the field now, so he would have gone from the age of 13 right through to the Civil War and would have been in jail twice. And I'm trying to find out where the hell he was. I know he was in Maryborough, I know he was in Mount Joy, but I don't know when. Yeah. I am in the process of, I'm in contact with the military archives. I've got certain information, to, but I'm not too sure. If you'd like to speak to me afterwards, if, you know, I have lots of names in files and various places. Right. 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 So if, well, I can check for you with the names. Excellent. I have a certificate and I have some medal and all that sort of stuff. So I know, I know that it was there, all right, but don't ask me. But the business of rising rebellion. Well, I why? mean, why this? Why was this word rising so important to them? I'm not sure. My straight answer is I'm not sure. Can I? Can I uh, yeah, go on. So, well, one reason is because r rising is an, originally an Irish language term. I, I really I really goes okay. back to Gaelic Ireland, and so yeah. they, they like this term for rebellion. There's another reason, though, which is that rebellion implies that you're a rebel, you're an outlaw, you're against the legitimate government. They didn't like okay. that. They didn't accept that they were rebels in that sense. Okay. They call themselves rebels sometimes, kind of ironically. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, but this is a traditional uh, republican, going back to the Fenians and before, traditional republican kind of. Um, terminology, they preferred terms like insurrection, things like that. They didn't like the term rebel. Um, regarding revolution, some of them, like Ernie O'Malley wrote that revolution was too fancy a term for what we have in Ireland. So maybe Ernie O'Malley agreed with that yourself. Um, though, and also revolution, in, um, a lot of these people were, or certainly became later, very conservative in their views, and they didn't like, they didn't like the, the communist kind of connotations of revolution. Yeah, yeah. That's another thing. Whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I mean, Finland, by the way, is truly a very bad example. I, I mean, think it's a tragic thing. It's a tragic, yeah. much worse tragedy in Finland, I would have thought. But, um, so they, some, however, the, in the Civil War especially, they do start to talk about the revolution. And funnily enough, the Free State side talk, start to talk about the successful revolution that we have. The Free State? Funnily enough, yeah. And the other, the other side start to talk about things like counter-revolution and reaction, which is the opposite. <laughs> 
But it's, it's, it's an odd thing that, um, yeah, re revolution is something the Free State talk about, but they talk about it as we successfully accomplished the revolution. This is the last revolution we need in Ireland. And very proudly the most conservative revolution. And Kevin O'Higgins very famously said, we, are, we were the most conservative ever revolutionaries to make a successful that's revolution. Again, that's Free State again. Yes. That's the Free State, yeah. So that's an interesting one. I'm afraid we have to wrap it up there. Thanks very much for everyone who contributed to a, a good, conversa good discussion there at the end. Thanks very much for coming. And thanks to Will again for coming out to speak to us.